when we ask four-year-olds to count five counters arranged randomly like this, you will see that they often count like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In other words, they count the same counters more than once and overlook the others. Most teachers correct children when they count like this, and they show them how to move the chips by going one, two, three, so that they would not count the same ones over and over. Now, four-year-olds can imitate the teacher who does that, but on the next day, they go right back to their own way of counting the same uh, counter more than once and overlooking the others, demonstrating that it is impossible to teach these children how to count five objects. Now, why is it impossible for four-year-olds uh, to uh, learn how to count five objects correctly? And the answer lies in uh, Piaget's theory about logical mathematical knowledge, which he studied scientifically for more than 50 years. And he made a fundamental distinction among three kinds of knowledge uh, according to their ultimate sources. And the three kinds are physical knowledge, social conventional knowledge, and logical mathematical knowledge. And I will try to explain each one of them. Now, physical knowledge is knowledge about objects in the external world. So here is a red sheet of paper, and uh, the color red is an example of physical knowledge. And if I went like this, this paper would tear. That's another example of physical knowledge. So you can see that the ultimate source of knowledge about objects is in objects. Other examples are the fact that uh, marbles roll, but cubes don't. Another example is that um, if you drop a glass on the floor, it's likely to break. But if the uh, glass is made of plastic, it is not likely to break. So that's uh, physical knowledge, uh, whose ultimate source is in objects. Now, the ultimate source of social conventional knowledge is conventions that people make over time. An example is languages, such as the words one, two, three, and uno, dos, tres. Another example of social conventional knowledge is holidays, like Thanksgiving and Christmas. Another example is rules about etiquette. And in this country, when you meet somebody, uh, the thing to do is to shake hands like this. And you don't use this hand, uh, you use this hand and not this hand. So those are examples of social conventional knowledge. And the ultimate source of social conventional knowledge is very different from the ultimate source of physical knowledge. Now you come to logical mathematical knowledge, and that is the hardest kind to understand. And number concepts are obviously part of logical mathematical knowledge. Now, for example, I can show you these two sheets of paper, and you will probably agree that they are different. Now, if you think that the difference 
between these two sheets is knowable with your eyes only, would you raise your hand? OK. Um, if you raised your hand, Piaget would disagree with you because he would say, the whiteness of this paper is physical knowledge, and the redness of this paper is also physical knowledge. But the difference between these two sheets is not observable because it does not exist anywhere in the observable world. And if you think these are different, that difference is coming from your head, your thinking. So each person is making that logical mathematical relationship in your head. And um, another example of a mental relationship you can make between the same two objects is the relationship similar. And it is just as true to say that these two sheets are similar as it is to say that they are different. So uh, that's the nature of logical mathematical knowledge. It comes out of each person's head, depending on how uh, that person is thinking about the objects. Now, I come to another example, which is the number two. Again, two is a relationship you can make. And when you think about these as two, they become two for you at that moment. And so um, this is not one. It's a red sheet of paper as far as your eyes observation is concerned. When you think about it as one, then it becomes one. And when you think about two, these as two, they become two. So um, now, the ultimate source of number concepts is therefore in each person's head. And if two is a numerical relationship, a person has to make all the other numbers like 3, 4, 10, 20, 100, 1,000, all the numbers have to be constructed by each individual. So this construction work from within is what traditional math educators have not understood unless they have studied Piaget's theory about logical mathematical knowledge. And the authors of the Common Core State Standards do not know anything about logical mathematical knowledge. And that is why uh, they define many, many objectives according, as if logical mathematical knowledge were social conventional knowledge. So now I would like to talk about the conservation of number to make the point that children all over the world have been found to construct conservation without a single lesson on conservation. So in the conservation task, uh, the interviewer aligns eight chips like this and ask the child to put out right here just as many chips as I put up here, put out here. And so uh, many four-year-olds can put out the same number like this, whereupon the interviewer say, watch carefully what I'm going to do. Be and so uh, she shortens one of the lines and lengthens the other line and asks the child, now, are there still as many here as here? Or are there more here or more here? 
And conservers reply, well, all you did was move them, so it's still the same number. That's a conserver. A non-conserver would say is, well, all you have to do is look at them, and obviously there are more here, because these are sticking out and these are sticking out. So children construct their own logic about number. And when they have constructed that logic, um, um, it's obvious to them that the number is still the same because that child has put out the same number. So this conservation task has been given all over the world, as I said, in North America, South America, all over Africa, all over Europe, in places like Tehran, in Asia, and even among the Aborigines in Australia. And they have all been found to become conservers without a single lesson on conservation. So uh, when they become able to conserve, they also become able to count five counters correctly. And um, here is Piaget's theory about what logical mathematical relationships number consists of. And one is hierarchical inclusion, and the other is order. And I'll try to explain each one of these, uh, starting with hierarchical inclusion. And so you can show five counters like this to a four-year-old, and uh, the, he will ask, he will count them one, two, three, four, five. How many did you find? Five. Would you show me five? It's that one. OK, so that's a child who does not have hierarchical inclusion. Now, when you and I count, we may say one, two. But mentally, when we say two, we are including one in two. And then we say three, and mentally, we are including two in three, and one in two at the same time. And then when we say four, the inclusion gets more and more complicated. And then by the time we get to five, we are mentally including four in five, three in four, two in three, and one in two, all at the same time. So that's the hierarchical uh, relationship that uh, uh, little children cannot make. In fact, four-year-olds count like reciting um, the uh, days of the week. And uh, so they can say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. When they are asked, how many did you find? You say the last word, so you say Friday. Will you show me Friday? Yeah, it's that one. So that's what's happening if you don't have hierarchical inclusion in your head. Now, I'll go on to order and explain what that means. OK. When you and I count, we may say one, two, three. But we put these in order, and we know exactly which ones we have counted and which ones remain to be counted. So that's the uh, role of order. We have to put things in order. And when we have a whole bunch of these things, then we move them so that we will we are able to keep them in order. So uh, both 
hierarchical inclusion and order are impossible to teach directly because they have to be done uh, in the child's head. And so um, the bad news from Piaget's theory is that number concepts are not teachable. But the good news is that it's not necessary to teach them because, as I said, children all over the world have been found to construct number concepts on their own, through their own thinking. So uh, now the question uh, that I would like to address next is, if number concepts cannot be taught directly, is it possible to teach them to children by encouraging them to think? And uh, here's uh, some evidence that shows that it is possible to teach number concepts indirectly. And this table has to do with children who conserved before and after kindergarten. Uh, so here is the fall, uh, the number of children who could conserve at the beginning of the kindergarten year. And here are the number of who could conserve at the end of the kindergarten year. And here is one teacher, his name was Carl, and he taught for a long time. I think he is still there. Uh, and here's one teacher, Patricia, who taught only one year here. And this teacher taught for two years and so forth. So th these are the teachers. And this teacher uh, also started with about zero conserver at the beginning of the year. But by the end of the year, 60, a big percentage of the children became conservers, as you can see. But here is a teacher who started with zero conserver and ended the year with zero conservers. Uh, and here is another teacher who started with zero and ended up with zero. So uh, here is uh, a bit of speculation on my part. But I think this teacher interacted with children in ways that made them think. For example, uh, if you go into his class, you will see him saying things like, tomorrow I think we will make Easter baskets. So I will bring a whole bunch of empty cottage cheese containers and strips of paper and other things you will need to make Easter baskets. So I want you to think about with whom you want to work tomorrow and where in the classroom you want to work. So children had to think, and the next day, all he had to do was, yes, I brought these things that I promised yesterday, so you can get to work. So children had to make decisions about with whom they wanted to work and where. And when children make decisions, or when adults make decisions, that's when we think the most. Uh, so he made children think. And now if you go to this teacher's classroom, you will see her saying things like, I didn't tell you you could pick up your pencil. In other words, she controlled the children. And they could not make any decision. And I think if you don't make, if you just obey, 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 you don't have to make uh, any decision. And I think this is what's happening here. So you have teachers who have very low percentages of conservers at the end of the year compared to these teachers at the top. So 
uh, these teachers, of course, did not teach any conservation because uh, when uh, we asked them, they would say, yeah, I remember hearing about conservation when I was in college, but I can't remember exactly how that went. So they certainly did not teach conservation. So now I would like to talk about three kinds of situations in which children can especially be encouraged to think. And those are situations in daily living. And the example that I just gave you is an example of situations in daily living. Another uh, situation is physical knowledge activities, like pick up sticks that I'll talk about, and group games like hide and seek. Uh, and I'll start with examples of situations in daily living. Okay, when a child spills milk, the teacher can say, get a mop and clean it up. That doesn't encourage thinking. But the teacher could also say, what do you need to do? Which is better. Or would you like me to help you clean it up? So even in a situation like that, banal situation like that, you can make the child think or not think at all. The next example is classroom rules. Some teachers greet the child on the first day of school with a whole bunch of rules. And uh, one of them is likely to be when the teacher asks a question, don't shout out the answer. Instead, raise your hand and wait to be called on. So that also makes children obedient and not thinking. But a better intervention is, way to handle that problem is to wait until the problem comes up. And then the teacher can say, I can't understand what anybody is saying because everybody's talking at the same time. Now, can you think of a rule you can make so that this problem will not come up and uh, let uh, children argue among themselves and decide on a rule by majority vote? Well, at one point, one child said, put scotch tape on everybody's mouth. And so that's a child's idea. So I would go along with that and try and see how well that rule works. And if it doesn't work, well, we can have another discussion and another think. Anyway, can I go first? That is what a child very often asks the teacher when a group is about to start a game. And many teachers say, yes, you can go first. But it's much better to say to children, well, I don't know because I think you can think about a rule you can make and ask everybody if that is a, word, a fair rule. And they may think about any, mini miny, mo, which doesn't sound like much, but it's much better to let children make decisions in that kind of situation. A fight over a toy. That's where two children are fighting over a toy. And many teachers say, well, you can have it for five minutes, and you can have it for five minutes. And that may solve the problem for that day, but it does not solve the problem for any other day. So it's much better if the teacher says, well, I think you two can talk this over and decide what to do about this problem. And I will keep the toy on this shelf. And when you have decided what to do about this problem, 
I want you to tell me so I can return the toy to you. So anyway, those are examples of situations in daily living where you can make children think or not think. OK, now we come to physical knowledge activities, which are activities like pick up sticks where children act on objects in order to produce a desired effect. And uh, in, uh, so I have those four examples, Jenga, balance game, and dominoes that I'll talk about. But here's pick up sticks. In pick up sticks, uh, children act on objects. In other words, they try to pick up as many sticks as possible without making any other stick move. So um, if it were your turn now, I think you would start out with this one, this one, and this one. OK. Now, um, let's see. All right. What you have done is making a classificatory relationship. By the way, this chart shows the three kinds of knowledge that I talked about earlier, physical knowledge, social conventional knowledge, and logical mathematical knowledge. And logical mathematical knowledge has been subdivided into classificatory relationships, seriational relationships, numerical relationships, spatial relationships, and temporal relationships. So when I say they make classificatory relationships, what I mean is you ask yourself, which one is the easiest one to pick up without moving any other stick? And immediately, we think about these. These are those that are not touching any the safest kind. OK. And the next thing you will do is ask yourself, which ones are the next safest ones? So what you have done here is put them into a seriated relationship. Seriational relationships means you put things in order according to their differences. So you can seriate people from the tallest person to the shortest person, or pick up sticks from the easiest to pick up to this is, these are the easiest, this, these are the next easiest, and these are the, well, impossibly hard ones. So that's the order. And um, let's see. You make re numerical relationships here in the sense that you try to pick up as many sticks as possible without making any other stick move. OK, you also make spatial relationships and time, temporal relationships. For example, when you do this and you put these two sticks into relationships, then this one, I think, is on top. So in terms of time, you're not going to try to pick up this one first. You're going to try to pick up this one first. So that's what's happening here. According to the spatial relationship, you make different temporal relationships. So that's the kind of thinking that is involved in pick up sticks. Now, if you use these games 
to encourage children to think, you have to modify the traditional rules of pick up sticks. For one thing, there are much too many sticks here, and nobody can make any relationship um, um, among these. So you have to reduce the number of sticks to about eight at the beginning. And then you can increase the number so that children can think about these. Again, uh, the traditional rule is uh, to put four or five children in a group and let them take turns. But if you want children to think, then you don't make them wait for a turn. So it's best to have only two or three children who play together so that the thinking time can be increased. OK, another traditional rule is to say to kids, you can keep trying to pick up another one and another one until you make a stick, another stick move. But if you want children to think, then it's better to change the rule to everybody gets one attempt. And then uh, that's it. The, then the turn goes to the next person. So those are the changes you have to make to the traditional game. Now I'd like to go to Jenga, uh, which uh, is a well-known game. And the uh, rule of the game is that you try to pull out a block without making the tower fall. And if you make the tower fall automatically, you are the loser of the game. And the person who pulled out as many sticks as possible is the winner. Uh, I think that's all that you need to know about this game. And I'd like to show you a videotape of two children, kindergarten age children, playing Jenga. This child's logic is more advanced than this child's logic. And see if you can figure out in what way this child is more advanced. There's nothing more I can take. Ah, there are some at the bottom. Now, can you see in what way this child is more advanced than this child? I had to watch this many, many times and finally realized what was happening. But this child, by and large, is uh, pulling out the two sticks that are on the edges so that he won more sticks than this child. And this child, on the whole, pulled out the one in the middle. And that's why he finished early 
because he was stuck with the two in the, uh, on the edges. That's all, he said. And he is going to start counting his blocks. One, two, three, four, etc. OK. Uh, now, let me talk about the classificatory relationships. Uh, these two children were making very different classificatory relationships. The less advanced child only pulled out the one in the middle. And uh, intuitively, that feels like a safer thing to do. And uh, the more advanced child had made spatial and temporal relationships. And he realized that. If he took out the one in the middle, then he just could not pull out anything else. But if he pulled out one at the, on the edge, then the tower was still stable. And so he made the spatial and temporal relationship that enabled him to classify the two on the edges in a way that uh, increased the number of blocks that he could take. So he obviously won more blocks than the other kid. OK, Space, uh, seriational relationships. OK, these children both left the blocks at the very bottom unnoticed. And so you can see that they looked for the easy, easy things towards the top. And the hardest one was uh, hard to notice. So, and I think you can tell when children are concentrating and thinking, you can see it uh, just by watching their faces and the, the movement of their hands. OK. This game also has to be modified when your objective is to encourage children to think. For one thing, um, it is best to reduce the number of blocks that we give to children. Don't give them the whole box, because uh, Relationships are much harder to make when there are too many blocks. OK, the box also says, don't let the players hold the tower down when they try to pull out the things. Uh, but I would get rid of that rule. Uh, these are kindergartners, and if they hold the tower down, it's because they are thinking that they hold it down. So I would encourage them to think and hold it down. The, another rule says, when you pull out a block, then you have to put it at the top of the tower. And children like to keep those blocks. And so these children were keeping them, as you probably noticed. OK, the next example is the balance game. And uh, you, the materials you use are a simple, empty plastic bottle. There are mil millions of them everywhere. And this is a flimsy uh, paper plate. Don't use an expensive one, because the expensive kind is too stable. 
in a flimsy one work better um, for this purpose. And uh, then you give them, at the beginning, I would give five unifix cubes of one color and five unifix cubes of another color to two players. And they take turns putting a unifix cube on the plate without making the plate fall. And uh, at the beginning, uh, many of them put one here and it falls. And then the next time, they try again, and it falls again. And it takes some time to make the relationship between the top of the bottle and the middle of the plate. So the classificatory relationship they have to make is the middle versus all the other places. Uh, and uh, uh, OK. At the end of kindergarten, many children put so many blocks that they can make a mountain uh, to put on that plate. OK. The classificatory relationships they can make are things like the middle of the plate versus all the other places. Seriational relationships, here is the middle of the plate and a little bit away from the middle. And gradually, they can uh, go farther away from the middle, gradually. And if they don't do that, the plate is going to fall. Numerical relationships, I think that's obvious. The person who used up his or her unifix cubes first is the winner. So that's obvious. And spatial relationships and temporal relationships also come into the picture, especially if you have to think about symmetry. Because once you put a unifix cube here, you have to go here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And you have to think spatially and temporally, uh, alternately, uh, to make sure that the plate stays up. So that's the spatial and temporal relationships. Now, I'd like to go on to the dominoes. You can see that for these children, creating the domino effect on the floor was easy. So the teacher gave them that box so that the domino effect got stuck there. And somehow, they are trying to figure out how to make that effect continuous and going up without having this problem.
you can see that they used a, a board. And that was easy. You can make them go from the floor to the top of the box with the uh, board. But without the board is the challenge for them. OK, the teacher has come around. And uh, I think this is a good time to talk about two principles of teaching that are very different from traditional principles. And uh, the first principle is don't show children how to be more successful. In other words, these children are very unsuccessful, but they are thinking hard. And if you help them and show them how to be more successful, you deprive them of a chance to think and invent a solution. So uh, don't be too kind. The second principle is when they are successful, don't say, good job, good job, and praise them which I hear all the time when I go into a classroom. And many children, well, children, first of all, know it already in a physical knowledge activity. They know when they succeeded. And to be told good job and being praised very often makes them concentrate on pl pleasing the teacher. And some of them become preoccupied with Teacher, am I pleasing you enough? And that kind of thing. And it's really not necessary and uh, quite annoying, as far as I'm concerned, to hear, good job, good job, etc. OK, I think that's enough for uh, the domino effect, and I'll go on to group games, such as uh, a regular group game, and I'll talk about the conductor in a minute, and a board game called Tapatan, and a card game called Lining Up the Fives. And all right. Here's the game called the conductor. And by the conductor, I mean something like a conductor of an orchestra. And uh, there is one child in this situation, one child who is chosen to be the conductor. And he is the first one to do various things like here. And the other children are supposed to imitate the conductor when he changes the gesture to be imitated by the group. And then there is a child who is in the hallway who is told, you can come in. Come in. And that child is supposed to guess who the conductor is. Uh, OK, and in the first game, the child will choose, will guess the wrong person. OK, that's the guesser. You're wrong, you're wrong.
Okay, it's this person or this person. Okay, um, now, the thinking that is happening here, uh, let's see, to find out who the conductor is, children have to make classifications, one person against all the others. And the temporal relationships they make are very important in this game because the conductor is the first one who does something, and that's the person that you have to guess. But these, these children are pretty bad about seriational relationships. For example, they will go from here, and then if they are good about seriating, they wouldn't make a huge change all of a sudden. But they go, <laughs> they do things like this, and then start stamping their feet, which makes a big noise which gives the spatial position away here. But uh, this group is pretty good about not everybody focusing, looking at the conductor. So that's uh, pretty, pretty good. Anyway, um, that, and then at the end, the teacher was asking, asking the guesser, how did you fi figure out who the conductor was? And that way, the group benefits from how the guesser was thinking. And, and so they will be more careful the next time. OK. The next game is Tapatan, uh, a board game. And this board game is very easy to make. And so that's the board. And each person is given three uh, counters. And uh, the first, they first decide who goes first. And then you will see in the first example uh, that they take turns putting one chip down and all three of them down. And after that, they have to slide uh, a counter to the next place. And the object of the game is to put three counters on a line, this way or this way or diagonally. And I think in the next example, you can see um, how the game begins. And I want you to look at this group. OK, she blocked him. Ah, uh, he noticed that he was is going to lose. I won. OK, this is a more advanced group. OK, she blocked this kid. She blocked this kid. Ah. OK. Um, there are many relationships children could make here. Uh, 
Let's look at classification here. One class is, one category is the times I have to prevent, I have to prevent, I have to block somebody from making a straight line. How do you recognize that? When there are two chips on a line already with a third space empty. That's when you have to be sure to block the opponent. So that's a category that they make rather easily. And so, of course, here is the temporal relationship. Between, before the person, the opponent, puts down a third chip, I have to block that person. Uh, OK, now, seriational relationships. Uh, let's look at here. When they begin the game, there are places that are more advantageous to use than others. The most advantageous place is the middle, because that one gives the possibility, gives four possibilities of winning. One possibility, two possibilities, three possibilities, and four possibilities. So that's the best place to start. And these children did not start there. The second uh, best place to start is in the corner, because you can make one line, two lines, three lines. And the least desirable place is on the side, because you can make one line, two lines, and that's all you can make. Anyway, uh, the next game is uh, lining up the fives. And you use cards like these, which are available on my, uh, you can download them from my website. Anyway, uh, you use cards, 10 cards, 10 yellow cards that go from 1 to 10, 10 blue cards that go from 1 to 10, and 10 pink cards that go from 1 to 10. So you use a total of 30 cards. And uh, three players is a good number. And you deal the cards to the three players like this. And um, OK. Uh, you can see the cards have been dealt, and purposely uh, they are kept lined up with the face up so that everybody can see and think about strategies, about everybody else's cards. And one thing to notice here is this child is more advanced than these two children because you can tell he already classified his cards. And uh, all the yellow ones are together. And these kids have the blue ones everywhere, the yellow ones everywhere, uh, the pink ones everywhere. And it's easier to plan strategies if you classify cards and seriate them. Let's see. Here. Uh, these are seriated by that child in the middle. Six, seven, eight, two, four, ten, three, seven, eight. And the first card that he played was this six. But it would have been better for him to use this card first, because here he knew that he had the card seven and eight. And he did not have to wait for anybody to put down anything to use these cards. 
But here, he should have used this because he depended on somebody else to put down the three to become able to play this two card. OK, uh, let's see. I should have said these cards, uh, the four can be used. Yeah, the four can be used, and the three, and here, the seven can be used. Thank you, thank you, he is saying. That says six, and, and the others are correcting him. That says nine. Are you going to pass? They are minding this kid's business. Uh, the significance of this chip is that the children were passing, passing too much just to prevent other children from being able to play cards. So they decided to limit the number of passes to two. So up to two, th this kid has, has already passed once. So the second one time he passes, he would get another one. And if he has to get a third chip, then he automatically loses the game. So that's the rule that the children made up. Are you going to pass? So this kid is already thinking about this kid's business. OK, you have to pass. All right, that kid decided to pass. And he could have played this card here, this card here, and this two right here. So he, ha he had three cards he could have used, but he passed just to prevent this, just to make sure this kid would lose. So strategies are rather important. Anyway, so anyway, here uh, the children had to classify the, the cards, and only one of them classified the cards and seriated them. Only one child did that. So the game had other possibilities. Uh, numerical relationships, these are also important. I have a four, 
so I cannot use this two yet until a three has been placed. So uh, there are numerical relationships as well as temporal relationships. And where can I put the, play this card? There are spatial relationships. So there are many uh, possibilities of thinking in this game. And um, kindergarten children who play this game of lining up the fives uh, learn how to read all the numerals without a single lesson on how to read numerals. And when they want to write numerals, they go to the cards and look for the number uh, to copy. So anyway, uh, I now come to a conclusion. And uh, I uh, try to emphasize in these analyses of activities that Logical mathematical knowledge is not constructed one bit at a time. And instead, logical mathematical relationships develop within a network of interrelated relationships that develop together. And in other words, number concepts consist of these two kinds of mental relationships that cannot be taught directly, but they can be taught indirectly uh, by encouraging children to think. And hierarchical inclusion is uh, related to classificatory relationships of uh, classifying, making bigger and bigger classes. And uh, I try to point out that all these activities have classificatory relationships. And order, putting things in order, also uh, came into the picture whenever children made seriational relationships. And so that's why. Uh, children construct these relationships indirectly by um, making classificatory and seriational relationships. And uh, I showed you how um, in a kindergarten classroom, some children develop number concepts much more quickly than others. And uh, that all depends on how much the teacher emphasizes children's thinking. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>